I spent most of my adult life um, as a therapist helping people um, to actually face things that they feared and really avoided for many years of their life. I, I often feel like a sadist doing it. Um, you know, I've kind of helped people with very severe um, phobias of mice who can't even say the word, they call them mickeys, or people who have real fears of, of spiders where they would seal their windows, keep the lights on at all time, and even jump at the sight of those tomato top things on the top of tomatoes for the fear that it would look like a spider to them and jump. And often the treatment, I, I get them to start to learn to face the anxieties and learn that actually the things that they fear don't necessarily happen. And if they stay with those anxieties, the anxieties come down. But to do that, it's a very difficult treatment. It's very effective, it's called cognitive behaviour therapy, and it's not necessarily what my TED's about. In fact, my TED's about some of the things I've learned in my training that I see as really important qualities. I started training in 1988. By the look of you, most of you weren't born. I was young, I was keen to be a therapist. Before that, I trained as a, as a, a registered psychiatric nurse. And I thought I wanted to actually go into something to really help people and trained in behavioral, psych behavioral cognitive psychotherapy. One of the very first patients I treated um, had a fear of what was called then AIDS. We call it, I'm going to call it HIV for the rest of the talk. But he had a fear of AIDS. He was very avoidant of anything he perceived as catching AIDS and would act in a way that would make sure he wouldn't possibly in any way catch AIDS. He was a young, young man. We're going to call him Bob for the sake of his talk. And even though everything I say is true, I've made sure that he's not, identif not identifiable from my talk. So, one of the things I did in the very first session, what we have to do, is we have to try and find out about, about, the, about his problem. So I'd ask him, what's his main problem? And then the aim is for him to tell me about that, for me to see if the techniques we use could be helpful to him. If they were going to be helpful, then what I would do is explain that to him and for Bob to decide whether or not he wanted to have a go at the treatment. So I started to ask him about, OK, Bob, tell me about all the things that, that you do because of your, your, your um, problem of, of catching AIDS. And he started in a very, what I thought was quite obvious way, the things he would avoid, whether it was hospitals, blood, needles, a whole range of sexual behaviour. Bob was, was a heterosexual man and very, very conservative in his views and very, very conservative with his life. But he was stripped of a whole range of areas and things because he feared the possibility of catching um, AIDS. I just want to rewind a bit. What was really important about AIDS in that, then, in 1988, is it was really seen as a death sentence and a very big thing. When I trained a couple of years earlier, working as a psychiatric nurse, I worked in a forensic unit, and there we had somebody who potentially had AIDS. And that was really, really a big thing. The newspapers were on to it, laundry services wouldn't come to us, we had to have all our food in plastic plates. It was the summer, and, and the laundry uh, service in the hospital wouldn't wash our laundry, and it was piling up outside, stinking during the summer. It was seen as a death sentence. It's a much more prejudice than it is now. So going back to Bob, I was asking him all the things, and going through those, all the things he was avoiding, and as a good therapist, I said, is there anything else, Bob? And he said, yeah, I avoid pre-packed sandwiches. And I thought, pre-packed sandwiches? Why would you avoid that if you're catching it? He looked a bit sheepish, slightly ashamed, and obviously he had had to explain it before, and rolled his eyes and said, well, pre-packed sandwiches in a triangle, what's happened is somebody has cut those sandwiches in half, there could be somebody with HIV, they bled onto the knife, the knife has got a bit of blood on, the blood's gone onto the sandwich, it looks like a bit of tomato or something, it's in the sandwich, I'm going to eat that sandwich. If I eat the sandwich, it may go into my mouth. I might have just the budding of a, of a mouse, mouth ulcer in my mouth and therefore could get contaminated that way and that's how I'm going to get it. So I'm going to avoid pre-packed sandwiches. I remember having this moment of, wow. And I suddenly got it. I could see how, tangentially, his mind had created a pathway to getting AIDS from pre-packed sandwiches. But that was, then became a very fearful object. But also, it activated my threat system. Suddenly, I could see how AIDS could be got in so many different ways. And I remember saying to him, I get it. It just kind of just flew out of my mouth. I tend to kind of talk very fast anyway. I went, well, I get it. At that point, I could see him look at me and go, really? And I went, yes, I do get it. I can see why that would be the case. That you, your mind has worked out a way because you're so fearful and your threat system is there of, of, of why that would possibly be the case. He says, well, everybody thinks I'm mad, and you're the first person who's kind of understood that. I go, no, I do understand it. I could see it. 
We all know, oh, is it going? We all know that in fact our threat systems are there evolutionary. They go right back to evolutionary times. And they're there for a reason. But in this case, it's like a very sensitive smoke alarm that goes off as soon as you put the bread near the toaster. You haven't even put it in and it goes off. Sometimes that happens to us. Now for Bob, because he was so fearful, he was able to see routes from any situation to how he would catch HIV. We'd overrun at that time. So the next session we're going to go through the treatment. On the way home, I started to see how I could catch HIV at every situation. I was sitting on the bus and I suddenly thought, oh, these trousers are a bit old. Say the person sitting next to me or sitting on the bus before me was a drug dealer and, he was, and, he'd, and he'd used a needle that was contaminated with blood from someone with HIV and that needle had broken off and a bit of a needle had gone in the bus seat and now I'm sitting on the bus, that needle could have gone up my butt and given me HIV. I started to see it everywhere I was. I started to ruminate about it and think of all these situations where I could have caught HIV. It culminated in this following situation. I often pick my thumb. It's not a very great habit, and I pick it, and sometimes it bleeds. I don't know if you do that. It's a habit disorder. It's the same as biting your nails, and I pick it, and it bleeds. So, I remember suddenly a time when I was picking my thumb and using a public toilet. Public toilets in those days were a bit more disgusting than they are now. Now they're kind of nice and silver, if there's any at all. But then, there were kind of like places that were often really filthy and covered in lots of bodily fluids. And I remember a time I'd used the public toilet and my thumb was bleeding and I suddenly thought, oh, maybe some bodily fluid has got inside my thumb and therefore I've got HIV. Now that was a time that my wife at that point was pregnant with my first daughter. And I suddenly made the link, oh, I wasn't worried about me, but if I had HIV, that means my wife would have HIV. If my wife has got HIV, my unborn child has got HIV. And suddenly that was my focus, that I had killed my unborn child because I picked my thumb. That was it. It was there. I could see the link. Oh my God, it's my thought. It was terrible. I couldn't stop thinking about it, that somehow I had caused my child to have HIV because I was picking my thumb and using the toilet. So I thought, oh. I then started to think, maybe I wasn't sure. So I started to act in a way to take less and less risks. I remember one particular thing I did was hide my toothbrush in case I hadn't quite passed it on to my wife yet and yet if our toothbrushes had got together somehow my bodily fluids on my toothbrush was going to get onto her toothbrush and then from that toothbrush she was going to catch HIV and somehow it would then be transmitted through the pl plasma through the body into my unborn child again. I got so bad that I even rang King's College Hospital to actually think about getting an AIDS test. Remember I was still treating Bob and I had to go and see him next session. I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? Am I going to avoid seeing him? But I could do, I can go to, my, go to my supervisor and say, you know, I'm new, it's my first patient, I'm finding it difficult, make some excuses for not seeing Bob. But part of me also felt really quite ashamed about that. I'd come into a job to try and help people, and there was me actually having all these anxieties as well. And also, how dare I in some ways? Bob was having them so much more than me. His, his um, effect on his life was huge. And because I was obsessed with this, suddenly I was thinking, oh my God, this is so awful that I can't deal with this. At the same time, how can I go and treat Bob? What am I going to do? I was in this dilemma. Luckily, I didn't have supervision until after I was next seeing Bob. So I didn't have much choice. I thought, OK, I'm going to go and see Bob, carry on with the treatment, it's what I'm meant to do. The very next session, I was sitting with Bob, and we're just about to start explaining how treatment was going to work, and the first thing he did was, Simon, I want to tell you that last week when you told me you understood about the sandwiches, um, that was, it was a really important moment for him, and what was more important, he then started telling me more and more things he avoided that were all really, really tangential in lots of different ways, which he had been ashamed of saying before then. That somehow, by normalising his problem and understanding it, it allowed him then to not feel so embarrassed about sharing all the other behaviours that he had. And of course, every time he said them, I, I get it, I totally understand how that behaviour could then lead to, to you then worrying about catching HIV. We then had a link together, a compassion that was in that process. That's really important, that bit. What then happened as well is I then started to explain the treatment to him. The treatment, as I said earlier, is actually starting to face these fears and actually finding out that we, we both knew that our thoughts were overinflated, that they were exaggerated, but because the feeling we had was so strong and so panicky, it feels really real. It feels like that actually you've done it now, you've caught AIDS, it's terrible. 
So he understood that what he was going to go, and go through was really, really difficult. That he was going to have to face a lot of situations, that he was going to have to go through the panic, that there was a fear for him this, that, that, that he'd work out a way of it possibly catching AIDS, but it was a really difficult therapy. And what I then saw was something that I found really important. I saw him be very, very courageous. I saw him look into himself almost and have that and say, no, I need to do this. I need to do this for myself. I need to get my life back. And I want to do this, Simon. And even though I was saying, really, it's going to be really difficult, he said, yes, I do. I need to do this. And at that point, I had another revelation about, oh, this is really important. I need to connect to this. And I need to be the best therapist I can for you, Bob. This is what I was saying in my mind. I was thinking, I do need to connect. I need to make sure that I can be the best person I can for you. And we connected in that sense. This is what I want to talk about, is, is courage and compassion. I think they're really important. Courage and compassion are very much interlinked. We know that there's in increasing research on compassion. Professor, Professor Paul Gilbert has spent years developing um, compassion-focused therapy and compassionate mind training. He's drawn from evolutionary psychology, neuroscience, and current psychological um, theories to pull them together. And, there's, and it's shown, the research is showing, that compassion is really key. And that what compassion can do, if we can activate those compassion systems, that it's really good for our health, it increases our health, it increases our happiness, it increases social and ethical behaviour, and is a really key part of learning and, ma and maintaining our lives. With Bob, what happened then is as we went through treatment, we started to face things together. By the second session, we were eating sandwiches. Not only were we eating sandwiches together, we were eating sandwiches in Soho in a gay bar. It was like we could, take, we could do this together. Gradually, he started to face his situations more and more. He, we, I see people up to a year follow-up, and by a year follow-up, Bob had not only had a partner, he was just about to move in with them and many of the behaviours that he had avoided had started to fade away. For me, the same thing was happening. I was able to continue, I, I, I continued to put my toothbrush in the same place, and started to re-engage in all the behaviours I'd avoided as well. I still haven't had an AIDS test at all. And my daughter is in the audience today. So she managed to survive, if she's got AIDS as well now, she's, no, I think she's there. I still pick my thumb though. Thank you very much.